put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version, and the link is in the description box. Thor The Dark World in 3D. Kind of. If you want to waste a couple extra bucks, don't watch in 3D. It's post-converted. You won't be able to tell. Anyway, movie review. So, we pick up one year after the events of the Avengers. Try saying that three times fast. And we see that things have not been completely calm around the Nine Realms with Bifrost <laughs> offline for that time. Asgard is kind of the, the peacekeepers. The, they go around to the other realms and, you know, fight their battles and bring in you know, various criminals, I guess, and put them in a prison in Asgard. I guess, basically, Asgard is America in this movie. And so we are told, we, we once again begin the film, just as with the first, with Odin narrating, putting that theater training to good use telling us who will be the scary monster race for the movie. And this time it's about the Dark Elves, led by Malachith. And they basically come from the darkness that was there before the light, and they want the universe to be dark. Again, I, I kind of see them as, I, I'm terrible at history, but I think it was maybe the Huns who were like a nomad people, and they, they thrived on desert. They could make things work where there wasn't a lot. They didn't really grow crops and such. So when they came across people who did grow crops, you know, they destroyed their land, you know, Put, put salt in the earth so that stuff couldn't grow there anymore because that's the kind of world that they could use. That's, that's, that's what suited them. And in a twisted sort of way, that makes a certain amount of sense. So, again, here there is... I mean, when you have this idea of, you know, they are darkness or they want darkness, it, that by itself is kind of dull and it's difficult to... It's, it's very abstract. The film does a great job visualizing that. We get some... some visions of what the, the, the dark world, the titular dark world, would look like. And you really do get a sense that this, this is bad. This is not something we want. Period. And so yes, to, to get back to Malachith and his race of Dark Elves want the world, the universe, to go back to that. But thankfully, Odin's father, Bor, defeated the, the Dark Elves and managed to hide the power source. It was this destructive force called the Aether. It, they could not destroy it, so they hid it somewhere that they didn't think it would ever be found. And, oh wait, it was found. So, yeah. Jane finds it. She has not really been doing well at this whole getting past Thor thing. She's been trying, but it just... The whole thing of hitting guys with her car 
to meet them, you know, the whole meet cute thing. When it's not Thor, it does tend to end up with them, you know, quadriplegic, so it doesn't lead to a lot of nice, fun dates. So, yeah, she's... She, she wouldn't mind finding him again, and she's, of course, been looking for him, and so she finds the ether instead, and like any good scientist, she goes all the way up to the big, threatening, scary thing, and touches it, and gets absolutely certain that whatever it is, she will be, you know, completely... It, it will do whatever it will do to her. It won't just sit idly by. And so Thor realizes this and he takes her to Asgard to be healed. And Odin is, is not quite happy with it. I think we've all had the, you know, unhappy father-in-law. And it does not make things easier when he is king of the gods and, you know, wields a d destructive scepter. Trust me, I have been there. So, yeah, the Dark Elves come back and they're a true threat. It, it really, the, the stakes are raised and, yeah, there's, there's a mission for Thor in trying to defeat them, and I won't really give away any more of that. And as you probably already know, he has to ally himself. He has to form an uneasy alliance with Loki, and yeah, that, that is everything I'm going to tell you about the plot. This is in a lot of ways an improvement on the first. I suppose briefly I should talk about the couple of things where the first one didn't quite... or, or the first one did something better than this. I feel that the love relationship between Thor and Jane was stronger in the first. I felt like in that you really got the whole sense of them falling in love and such, and as the second movie dealing with the two of them, I mean, there's still a couple in this, so you would sort of expect, you know, Iron Man 2, we get to a new, you know, the relationship moves to a new level. There's, there's some kind of change there, and here it just doesn't really seem to happen, and yeah, is you know, it is not the you know the worst love story featuring Natalie Portman this side of a Star Wars prequel, but it's just it's not quite you know engulfing flames either. And I will definitely say that this one goes for more action than the first at the expense of character development, and that is obviously, you know, character development is always a good thing, and certainly the first one did quite well at that, and this one definitely not so much. Now, with that, we segue nicely into the pos excuse me, positives. The, the more plentiful action not only makes for just a more exciting, more enjoyable viewing, but it's also more varied action, where in the first you have a lot of the same kind of thing, where it's like, it's these gods fighting other creatures and the like, and that's kind of it. In this one, not only do you have gods fighting creatures, you have chases, you have mid-air fighting, you have just... There's an attack on a big building. I don't want to give too much away here, but just... There's a lot of different action in this, and it really does a good job of having a lot of action 
without any of it being repetitive or feeling like that didn't really need to be there or, you know, all of it just really, yeah, it, it works and it's just, in, in a lot of ways, this is a bigger film than the first one. And I suppose this is a good time to, to sort of say that the, the mission of the first one was very much to link Thor to Earth. Because Thor, of the Avengers that have gotten their own movies, is the only one who is not of Earth. So we need to kind of define why should the audience care about him without losing where he's from. Because his identity is also somewhat separate from Earth. So the first one was about that, about defining who Thor is and showing just a little bit of where he's from so that we have that. That's why the first one has so much of Thor on Earth and why this one is more... Thor does not spend a lot of time on Earth in this film. We do not spend a lot of time on Earth in this film. Where the first Thor sort of just turned the, the doorknob and opened the door just a tiny little bit to the, the, the universe, the outer space. Whereas, you know, until then it was, you know, Earth. You know, outside of Thor. We're talking Earth, you know. Even, even in the Avengers, the, the threat from the universe is related to Asgard and Thor. So, yeah, we needed to, to just open it just briefly, open it just a little so it doesn't become overpowering. And then with Avengers, we open it a little bit more, let in some, you know, unfriendly invaders. And now with Thor The Dark World, we open the door much more. In this, we do see several of the realms that only, you know, the, in the first one it, it mentions the, the nine realms. In this one we see a couple of them and we really do get a sense that they are there and they are part of this overall world and we get a sense of the responsibility of Asgard to keep all these safe. With, with Asgard being sort of, it's, it's full of gods, good gods, and, you know, they, they are the ones with the strength and the, the virtues that would make them good for, you know, keeping the rest of it safe. Now, the... I suppose a good... I gotta talk about the humor. There's a lot of humor in this film, and it's a really good idea because as, as I've just been talking about the, the whole getting into the space, getting into outer space with this sort of thing, you need to be careful not to overwhelm the audience. And this it just has just enough of these, you know, punchlines that just take the edge off the sometimes really vast and epic elements to this. You know, the, the idea that there are all these different realms. Yeah, you just, you need something... Yeah, you, you need to laugh to, to just release that tension. It's, it's a lot like the humor in Terminator 2, where you have this, in, in theory, these, you know, these concepts are either awe-inspiring or hilarious. So you need to balance that so that it doesn't become, you know, where Terminator 1 is just scary and intense and, yeah, just nerve-wracking at points. Terminator 2 knows to have some fun with the T-800 so that we so that it isn't so heavy all the time, but without, you know, it's not Terminator 3, it doesn't turn the character into a parody. 
and here again we have a lot of fun stuff with Thor, the god from another world, and Asgard, and yeah, the various elements of, of science fiction and, and fantasy in this. One quick thing that I do wanna... I, I quite like how this d does, the, the science fiction and fantasy, but I do wish that the weaponry had been a bit more creative in design. A, a lot of the weapons are just the normal kind of stuff. At, at points it almost feels like this is just your average action movie, just with, you know, gaudy costumes and, and such, because literally, like, there's this one guy who wields a rocket launcher, just a straight up rocket launcher, nothing special about it. There are some lasers, okay, you have that, you know, typical sci-fi aspect there, but again, nothing particularly fantastical about these lasers. They're not, it's, it's maybe the way they're treated, you know, that it, there just isn't quite enough kick to it, you know, I mean, when you watch Star Wars, that's not the first movie with lasers, but it's made to be important, it's made to be dangerous, and this one doesn't quite do that. It actually does have a, a some swords that look kind of like lightsabers too, so th there's that, but yeah, there's just... There are too many guns that just seem like regular guns, but then there is one really cool weapon that I've, I've already mentioned that basically the Dark Elves are darkness and they want this, again, this somewhat abstract concept of just a world of darkness. So, of course, something that they use as a weapon is a black hole, so they have these grenades like hand grenades that they throw that create a tiny black hole that suck in the enemy or enemies around it. And that's that's a really cool idea that they would harness a, a black hole, that energy, and use it as a weapon because that's what they are about. They are about removing what is and leaving only black darkness nothingness. So that's that was a really good idea. And it's, I can't think of another movie that has that kind of weapon. And that's, that's really what you want to go for. There, there are parts of this where it seems like they're aiming for Star Wars, that otherworldly quality. And it certainly has otherworldly qualities, but a lot of it is missing in weaponry and such. And a lot of it is that they don't... A lot of what makes Star Wars so unique is the the sound design, which is very foreign to us. And that's always something, when you hear a language that you're unfamiliar with, it sounds very foreign to you, and that's what makes it, you know, if, if you hear, if you as a native English speaker hear someone speaking, you know, just something similar to English, or English with a thick accent. You, it doesn't feel as foreign as if you're hearing someone speaking, I don't know, Eastern European, for example. So, it, it's a good idea to, to get some foreign sounding sound effects in there. And, yeah, Star Wars does it quite consistently. This one doesn't really do it at all. That, that was actually some of the worst. Sometimes you couldn't even see what the gun was supposed to be firing, but it sounded just like a regular gun. It sounded like, like, I mean, regular, like, Earth gun, you know. And that was, yeah, Th that, that took you out of that kind of otherworldly quality. It's, it's a very dynamic film that, f it's, it's always moving without it being so fast that you have a loose track. It has a fairly... The, the plot is not terribly complicated, although I, did, I saw some reviewers say it was, I'm not quite sure why, but it's to each their own. The, it's, it's simple enough, it's, it's easy enough to follow, but there will be some surprises along the way. I will definitely say, th this is something where the first one did a better job, the villain here is pretty... 
it's, it's especially the motivation. The motivation is just, you kind of, I don't want to say just he's evil, but it's basically Malachi, I guess, wants revenge for, and he wants to turn the universe back into the way it was when he thrived. So, again, there is that thing of, it's, it's not just super, you know, super villainy, Saturday morning cartoon super villainy just plain evil kind of thing, but yeah, it's, Malachi doesn't really have any personality beyond that, and yeah, this is probably the most boring villain in one of these, excuse me, you know, Marvel-verse movies, I mean, talking about the ones that relate to Avengers and such. Now, the, the Dark Elves are quite cool. The, there was a, an elven language made up for the film and you know you have the you know Jesus stick from Lost playing you know this a lieutenant of, of Malachi who is you know he, dudes in heavy prosthetic prosthetics and he is basically like this lava-like creature, just really destructive force and, and seemingly unstoppable force. And that's, you know, with that we have something that a hero like Thor really needs. A good challenge to face. You know, we have this enemy that, that seems unstoppable. So, yes, Thor can fly and he's got the hammer and the whole thing, but how can he stop something that is literally seemingly unstoppable? So, that's, that's a, a great addition, and the, the, I mean, his performance is great. It, apparently, he had to do his own stunts because the, the stuntman didn't move quite like he did, so, yeah. And, and he certainly is, you know what do they say, a, a physical actor, he's, you know, he throws himself into a role and you can really tell, so yeah. And the, the director has, is, is known for Game of Thrones and I believe this is his first feature film and I've only heard of Game of, heard about Game of Thrones but I can certainly tell why the, you know, it, it has this, the same thing of, it is a human drama set against a fantastical backdrop, but it really is about these people, or in this case, these gods, these a a Aesir. I don't know the word in English, I'm, I'm Danish. I know the mythology, I don't know the words in English, particularly. Now, the... The, the, the world of the Dark Elves, Svartalfheim, was that they used Iceland as a location to get this sort of, you know, unwelcoming, you know, very threatening area and, you know, environment, and, and that really works. Now, the this one very much it 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 very much takes the sort of Loki's Loki sort of has to face the consequences for what he's done up until now and that's you know this is the third film where we see Loki and this is the only time where we really have time to slow down and actually see something happened there, some kind of, yeah, consequence to it, because in the other two he was, you know, yeah, if, if you've seen them you know, if you haven't you shouldn't know from, from this video, so they, they, they go into that and there, there is a, Loki, and his mother figure, Frigga, 
the, the, the yeah the mother of the, the Aesir is they they have a conversation about the you know the things he's done and and this whole thing and the the conflict that's been brewing between Thor and Loki very much comes to a head in this film and they really do it great. That's something I really find that this one did fantastic with it. They they have a lot of characters and I feel in Thor 1 they were kind of just there. They didn't really they were present but didn't do that much. In this for for various reasons, the it's it's. I don't want to say exactly what what happens, but we don't follow all that many characters a lot of the time, and that's great because it leaves room for just a more personal. Yeah, some some more personal character stuff, some more personal relationship exploring and they they use it really well now jane is sort of a fish out of war in asgard that really doesn't you know it, it doesn't it isn't used that much i i kind of expected it to be i i thought that they were going to make her our avatar so that you know the the audience's avatar so that she can ask the questions that we want to ask and she can be told the things about Asgard that we need to be told but you know the the gods don't need to be told but they didn't really do that but and without us you know feeling that we weren't told these things now the this very much makes Thor badass again, which is quite good because in the first one he was getting knocked out so much that Silver Age Green Lantern said, hey, that's my bit. Credit for that one goes to my ex fiance Now, the... This one also does not add a lot of new characters, and thus, again, we can focus on what has been built up so far. With Frigga, and to an extent also Odin, getting to have more of a role, and have more... Yeah, just have, have more weight to them, get, become more fleshed out, because they've, they were established in the first one. And now there is, you know, there are some things that are worth exploring that have happened since we first met them, and yeah, so so we spend some time with them, and yeah, through that we we get more. Yeah, this, the, the film does really well with using characters. Now, we, we spend... We, we get... or Heimdall gets more of a role, which is great because Idris Elba is always awesome. And we also see more of Asgard, and Asgard has a bit more grit to it. it Branagh's Asgard was very shiny. And that worked for the first movie, but here we get, you know, the dark world. We get a bit darker, and there are several great references to mythology and to these... And, and they're not like, they're not going to confuse people who don't know what it is. It's just little, you know, blink and you'll miss it details. And, there are some some customs of yeah it's it's if if you go into it with some some knowledge of, of Norse mythology 
you're going to enjoy the uh, appreciate the the attention to detail that was put into a lot of that. Now, and of course, definitely stay beyond the credits, and I do mean beyond there. Wait until there is no image left on the screen. That's that's all I'm going to say. Now, the let's see. I I suppose that. Let's cover it then. I actually the effects are quite good. There are a few things where it's it's like only okay, but on the whole, it definitely the the there's a, a genuine epic scope to it. You really like the 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 dark elf that you know really a dark elf and I suppose Aldrin the that Thor has to fight he's he's taller than like normal people he's he's a big guy not not Hulk big but bigger and yeah there's and and there are these huge spaceships and just yeah you can definitely tell that there's you know the world is getting bigger the the universe of the outer space world in the marvel verse marvel verse is getting bigger now I suppose that quite comes. Actually, yes. To and another thing that with with the first Thor having established Thor and having established his world, this one can can go beyond Asgard and can really go on a journey, a sort of classical fairy tale. You know, leaving one's homeland to go out on a dangerous quest kind of thing. And so so it has that kind of fantasy element to it of, of the, the dangerous but necessary quest. And that again is something where you know that's that's where that's that's where you want to take Thor as as a movie, as 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 a movie property. You you don't want to just be, be limited to Earth or even Asgard, you want to take him beyond because that's what he opens up. And that's that's very much what we get here. And it has that feeling of the it it feels like if Thor doesn't go on this mission, if Thor doesn't win, then it literally will all just fall apart. The you know, I'm I'm not gonna explain why, but you'll see in the movie they really did a great job of just setting up how this was, why this is so important, and I do believe that covers it. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.